so we've gathered this idea that symbols can communicate to the self more effectively than words can. They speak to you and they're about you. This is what is important to realize when looking at a lot of these symbols. When studying an alchemical doctrine of any sort, one should realize that despite being naive even, their interpretation of the message being sent is never necessarily wrong. In the same way that a song of lyrical vagueness can be interpreted by the listener this way, by a different listener in a completely different way, alchemical symbology and this kind of non-language form of communication speaks to the soul. It's imperative that we talk about the concept of sacrifice. We're not talking about blood sacrifice here, although the derivatives of what we'll be speaking of does come from a long line of unfortunate rituals. What is important about sacrifice is that first rule that we were speaking of earlier. There is no gaining anything without exchanging something of equal value. It seems as though in our given reality, when we choose sacrifice over pleasure, within the current moment, we find fortune waiting for us. Whereas the opposite, if we choose pleasure now, the sacrifice then comes later and it is not able to be controlled like it is the other way around. It seems as though sacrifice now equals pleasure later and vice versa. Exercise becomes strength and speed. Lethargy, gluttony become a weakness. Listening now becomes wise words later. Speaking now becomes ignorance. Helping others is helping yourself in the future. Most of the time you won't perceive that cause and effect immediately. But the idea is that choosing discomfort within the endeavors of our life seems to pave an easier road in the future and in many ways can even tune the human temple into its most grandiose form, its final form, if you will. Sacrifice is often associated with suffering in general, but suffering gives us a problem to solve and this generates a, a reason to go on. A movie has troubles and antagonists and games have tasks and challenges, otherwise they would be boring and of no use. If we are to assume that a small consciousness leads to a small view of the world and a large consciousness leads to a, a wide view of the world where you can see a, a much more broad range of opportunities to take advantage of. Well, the way to a large expanded consciousness seems to be through suffering and sacrifice. This doesn't mean any sort of dramatic sense, but in a way, if you put yourself outside of your shell and walk out of your comfort zone, so to speak, to think outside the box, and thus escaping the box, doing new things, interacting with new people, doing the difficult work that no one else wants to do, doing things that we are afraid of doing. All of these things, they expand our consciousness. Suffering creates art, causes us to drive technology. The reason we have bridges is because those who would cross rivers would go through great troubles, thus suffering to get across. Therefore, that suffering caused certain men with know-how to take on the sacrifice of the time and effort in order to build bridges. And I'm sure you can imagine most things are a derivative of sacrifice. But when it comes to the self and us within our own lives, I kind of like this allegory of uh, the buffaloes and the cows. If there's a, a field where buffaloes and cows are both groups are grazing and there's a storm on the horizon that's coming in quick. The cows run away from the storm out of fear, but the buffaloes begin walking steadily directly into the heart of the storm towards it, which seems insane to the cows and maybe even insane to us but let's take a look at the results of that sacrifice discomfort of the buffalo as the cows run from the storm the storm continues to come and grow and eventually these cows will wear out and die of exhaustion or at the worst end up caught in the storm while completely debilitated, making things worse. But the buffalo who steadily marched into the storm suffered 
for a much shorter period of time as the storm passed over them, considering they were going towards it thus in the opposite direction. That is sort of the definition of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. The cows have the knowledge to know that the storm is uncomfortable, so they ran. Whereas the buffalo had wisdom. Wisdom to know that when you face that dragon head on, you defeat it. In a way as difficult as it is to accept, we should avoid doing what feels good and instead opt to do what is right. Albert Einstein said, a ship is always safe at shore, but that's not what it's built for. It illustrates quite well that staying in that safety zone has completely lost its own purpose. When we say no to opportunities that arise in our life because we feel like the time isn't quite right or perhaps we're just not ready yet, we are choosing safety over risk by leaving our comfort zone. Even if we fail, due to the laws of alchemy, we can be rest assured as long as we surrender the results that despite failure, you are growing within character, growing within wisdom. Staying safe seems to always end up as a regret. I mean, a lot of you remember, you know, 2000. So despite what anybody might be going through, they can know that misfortune does add to wisdom and character. And may our pain be worthy of good fortune because we've earned it. However, we can't let life suffer us. We have to suffer life and do it deliberately. We have to do it first. We have to sacrifice parts of ourselves first in order to gain the fruits of what transmutation comes with because none of it is free. Carl Jung blessed us with the words, similar to a tree, the roots of a person are unseen. They consist of our beliefs, experiences, environment, etc. But what really defines a person are their trials, adversities, and tribulations. And really that is what, in a way, defines mankind. There's more than one reason that alchemical manifestos appear in the form of symbols as opposed to words. And one of the reasons, of course, we covered earlier seems to be obvious at this point, but an another reason is to keep your secrets safe not to keep power to yourself, but to avoid persecution by the establishments, various establishments, including religious sects and government that by all means will avoid people coming to their own self-awakening, which is what alchemical transmutation is all about. If you were to look at the secrecy of the Freemasons, for example, their secrecy leads to a lot of speculation and conspiracy when in fact, they're one of the most charitable and giving and loving and teaching organizations on earth, but they are unfortunately suppressed because their goal is to awaken, to alleviate the suffering of all beings. This goal of theirs is stifled at any turn possible by the higher echelons of the control system. The alchemical process is said to lead to the philosopher's stone, which there is a huge misconception about that stone being a physical item and even rumors of it being coagulated from urine or cerebral spinal fluid. But this is, again, not the case literally. We have to start thinking in symbols. The stone, the philosopher's stone is the self, the self beyond the ego, beyond what you identify as, your conscious format. The thing that exists and observes the rest of what you consider you. That's the Philosopher's Stone. That is what is to be fine-tuned, along with the rest of the body, which is the temple. And that's another metaphor to consider, is that the temple seems to be a symbol for the body, the altar represents your actions, and the soul is the Holy Grail. This concept of transmutation is absolutely a gift to anyone who understands the necessity of the rain, so to speak. An article entitled The Seven Stages of Alchemy illustrates quite beautifully some of the metaphors utilized within these seven steps of the alchemical process, being calcination, dissolution, separation, conjunction, fermentation, distillation, and coagulation. Calcination. The 
process of calcination is the beginning of alchemy. To calcate something is to burn it until it is reduced to ashes. Any unnecessary residue of the base metal, which is us, could be our ego, some of our unfortunate habits, or characteristics of our personality that we are blind to but need to correct. The second step, disillusion seems to be based around meditation. That is to make subtle the desires and unfortunate attachments that we gain throughout our life with our animal bodies. Meditation seems to bring stillness to that chaos, which is important when moving forward in this refinement process. The third step, separation, seems to be having a clear view of these characteristics that either need to be corrected, refined, or exacerbated, and by separation, that is the category, category, the categorization of these attributes of the self, we can take a fine look at them and see how they need to be tuned. The process of separation seems to make us more aware of our authentic feelings and desires. Conjunction is the return of these attributes into unity, a unification of the opposite, so to speak, which is a quite reoccurring theme within all esoteric studies. The marital bond between opposites such as life and death, male and female, sun and moon, so to speak, or integration of the shadow element of the psyche into our conscious form. As Jung said, until we make the unconscious conscious, it'll control our we'll call it fate. There is then the process of fermentation, which you want to create the germ. Uh, a quickening, so to speak, of a potentiality that is residing within, waiting to be accessed. But this is alleviated a bit by this next step, which is distillation. This is to bring purity and almost a form of sweetness to the process that has been rigorous as all hell thus far. But the reason it seems to be a little, still a little within the gritty side of things is because this process forces us to confront our own shadow elements, to confront the, the parts of ourselves that we deny or are entirely blind to, the parts of ourselves that by all means hold us back from what we should be doing. The last step, coagulation, and by all means the coolest word, coagulation is fun to say, but it is the thickening of those subtle energies into a useful and practical format that is to be recognized by us and not necessarily preached about, but to embody. We are to embody the philosophy that we have taken on as opposed to spreading it as a message. Trash is gonna flow. Coagulation, you might think of an idea coming to fruit, something that is not physically real, that can be made real through this seven step process. Coagulation represents how you conduct yourself and your character, that is your, your temple, your altar, and how you carry yourself throughout the world as a renewed being and maintaining that renewal on a regular basis through discipline and practice. And of course, sacrifice, bringing us back to what I feel like is the main core of the alchemical process, if you ask me. The idea of the coagulation of spirit and body being in tune with each other or a form of hemisync between the hemispheres of the right and left brain. These things don't come to us naturally, at least anymore, especially in today's society where we are belligerently distracted from righteous ideals. It just goes to show that the alchemical process, although misunderstood and safe to say fairly complex upon first appearance, might be a little bit more simple than we are apt to think about, apt to assume. It seems as though in the same way that if you were hungry, you might dr go through the drive through and get fast food. Food immediately, that's pleasure now. And then you pay for that later 
that sacrifice finds you in the form of health issues. However, if you are to gather groceries, fruits and vegetables and prepare a meal at home, well, that's work, that's sacrifice now. However, the pleasure comes afterwards and is greatly increased. And that form of pleasure that you've partaken in is now controllable to your will. The same goes for working out. It's difficult now, it becomes pleasure later, and you get to choose the outcome in this case. Whereas sitting on the couch is pleasurable right now, it's comfortable. But, and there is a time and place for that. I'm not saying don't sit on the couch, but sitting on the couch should be the result of the cause. Sacrifice now leads to pleasure later and vice versa. There seems to be no way around it. And even those stricken with the most incredible luck eventually find that this law catches up with them at some point. And I'm sure you watching this can think of an example where you've seen this law take place. But it's something that I feel like we all know, but we can't seem to hold on to because of the distractions that are forced upon us by the world, the media, advertising, schooling systems, work, gossip. I mean, the list goes on of things that seem to pull us away from what is important. A person might say that they would take a bullet for their child, and I feel exactly the same way. This is the essence of sacrifice. If we can apply that same passion and that same ethic to our everyday moments from second to second, trying to keep a mindful awareness of this concept, we might be able to impregnate our life with that same ideal, that same passion. We should treat today as taking that bullet and we should treat tomorrow as saving our children. In a way, 